is soul food anyway? No, what is it? Mac and cheese? I could comment, but I better not. Well, I want to ask Tori and Alex to come on up. And uh, I want to tell you, these guys uh, are going to be sharing today. Uh, one thing that I love is, well, there's several things that I love. I love my wife, first of all. <laughs> wife. And there's, there's some people that are gaining wives. I mean, you know, there's not more than one wife, but they're gaining a <laughs> wife. But I love young people that are committed to God, um, that are on fire for God. And I love young people also that are willing to answer the call of God, regardless of where it takes them. For those of you that do know me, know why this is dear to me and dear to my heart. But when young people will commit themselves to be used of God, and this applies for every young person, when you decide to give yourself to God, then you can be prepared that he's going to use you in tremendous ways. Whether anybody sees it or not. Some people get seen because they want to, and some people they don't want to, but they still get seen. But then there are other people who are willing to follow God when nobody sees. Well, nobody except him. And then when we get to heaven, we all see at that point. And so I'm going to give the microphone to each of them, and I'm going to let them share what God's laid on their heart for us today and for this morning, and then I'll come back later. Okay. Good morning. Uh, Jeremiah asked that Alex and I share a little bit about our story with all y'all, and that we share a little bit about what we're going to be going to do in Tanzania. Um, before I begin with that, I'd like to introduce two people here we've got that are going to be with us this summer. One is Ben Gilzon, my bro from, from, from Africa. And then we have Hannah over here. She's also coming out for the summer. So it's going to be a good summer. Anyways, and who knows, Ben might be out there permanently. Maybe Hannah too. They don't know yet, so God knows. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, we want to we want to share with you a little bit about how we each got to Tanzania, how this became a thing, and then how <laughs> yeah. a good this capital this, um, and then also just about what God is doing in Tanzania and how God will be using the two of us over there. So yeah. Okay, so um, just to start with how I got started in missions, um, honestly, quite a few people at this church know and have been there from the beginning um, because I was um, already attending Heart of the Father when I decided to go out to the mission field. <coughs> so some people like Barry and Diane have, have seen the journey, and um, so it's been, it's been kind of fun to, to be a part of this church all the way through. Um, I was at Southeastern, um, I was, I think I was finished with my sophomore year and I was studying music, um, church music, because my plan was to be a worship leader in a church somewhere and just kind of do that for the rest of my life, or um, I didn't really have a plan for missions, um, wasn't specifically on my radar, but the summer before my junior year, I was um, back home with my family. My mom was um, just interviewing for her job at Southeastern, um, and so the degree she was interviewing for was English and Intercultural Studies, which is a, a missions degree that's kind of couched in the English department, so it's ESL, and um, I just kind of checked out the degree curious. I wasn't really intending on 
changing my major. I was just curious about this degree. And then I was just, I remember specifically being up in my room and then just like filling out a change of major form. And I'm not really sure why. I just did. And um, came downstairs and was like, so I think I'm probably going to be a missionary. <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay, that's different. <laughs> um, so I just, I don't know. I honestly don't have like a big, a big moment, a huge powerful moment where I felt like I was called to the mission field. Um, I also don't think it was something that was on my mind most of my life. It was just a, it was just a, a very subtle, quiet moment where I just changed. And um, I remember being in one of my first missions classes with Dr. Robert Houlihan, and he kind of explained how he got into missions, and he said that he didn't necessarily feel like he was pulled into missions. He feels like he volunteered. And I feel like that is very biblical because you hear this, this here I am, send me call, um, this response to the gospel message, here I am, send me. Um, and so I kind of feel like that was how I got involved in it. Um, and then f as far as Tanzania goes, I um, started, I signed up to be on this documentary missions team to uh, Tanzania. And um, we, he was hosting it in Tanzania, didn't know him at the time, um, and just went out in 2012, I think, on the short-term team. And um, it was powerful for me, realized that it was a time, it was a place that God wanted me to be. Um, I remember that night, I remember a night in Tanzania where I felt a specific call to go back to Tanzania, and it was um, kind of an overwhelming Holy Spirit moment where I was sobbing uh, in the back of his truck and um, just knew at that moment that God wanted me back in Tanzania. Um, and I worked, I still had one more year at Southeastern, so the whole, my whole senior year at Southeastern, I was just pining for Tanzania, and um, then I graduated uh, May 2013, and that summer moved over to Tanzania, and I was there for about two and a half years. So yeah, go for it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, some of y'all have heard Alex's testing, testimony before. I think I might have shared my testimony long, 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 long time ago, maybe back on like Lime Street or something like that, like way back, a while back. Um, but, or way over, I don't know, one of these locations. Anyways, but it was a long time ago. Um, most people here have not heard my testimony. I actually grew up on the mission field as a missionary kid and swore I would never be a missionary. I was like, my dad wasted his life. People didn't appreciate him. I'm not going to waste my life in Africa. And so, uh, because honestly, when you're a missionary, um, people don't usually appreciate you until you're either a retired missionary or you're a dead missionary. And then everybody can't stop talking about how great that missionary was. And then they put it on the new missionary. Um, so, but that's like with pastors and everything else. You know, the last pastor, he was so much better than you, but, or something like that. It's like stuff like that. Anyways. So I just thought to myself, I will never be a missionary. I would rather, and I, Personally, I really like living in America, just to be honest. America's nice. Uh, I have an American dream. No, I'm joking. Um, but when I was over here back in the, uh, just before I came back to the States, I got saved when I was about 16 years old. I deliberately didn't get saved as a missionary kid because I knew that if I got saved, God would get me to do something I didn't want to do. And so I held out for a long time, and I said, mm-mm. I remember all my siblings getting baptized. I was like, no, I'm not ready. And, and I remember my parents being like, whoa, okay, Tori's serious about not wanting to do this. And I think that was a wake-up call for them, and they started praying, and different ones of my, my uh, short-term teams that came out, I think my parents talked with them about it because everyone kept hinting and jabbing. And I remember one guy, we were about to move back to the U.S., our whole family, and my dad was going to take a, a position as, a, as, a, as a, a mission pastor at a church, large church on Long Island. And he said, Tori, if you go back to the States and you're not serious about Jesus, you'll be forever lost in what is America. And that kind of woke me up a little bit. And I started reading my Bible and started really seeking God. 
And my life was transformed through the reading of the word. My, 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 my mind transformed everything about who I was was never the same. I loved Jesus. Like, like, I loved Jesus when I came back to the States, but I had no power to really serve him. And I remember um, I was at a mission conference, and God got me. And there's an old Chris Tomlin song, All of Life Comes Down to Just One Thing, and that's to know you, oh Jesus, and to make you known. And this lady speaker, and I had a thing against lady speakers, but this lady speaker, at the, at the time, she got up. <laughs> Okay, I'm being honest today, okay? Um, and, and she was up there, and her, her name is Jody Bunn, and she spoke on missions. And so a lady speaker I didn't think highly of at the time spoke about missions, which I really didn't think highly about at the time. And I, that God, through the most humiliating of circumstances, Brought me down to the altar for like six, seven hours. And my life has never been the same. And then I took class on perspectives of the World Christian Movement. Radically altered the way I saw missions. And when all my plans in America fell, fell apart, I was like, I guess I'll give God a chance. So I went and I hated it. Really, really, really hated it. Like, I've never done anything so miserable. And I was like... I am called to inner city youth ministry in the States. What am I doing here? <laughs> and then it hit me like a Mack truck, and God said, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And he gave me a call for that, which I never had a passion for. And I want to say something to you guys here today. Um, if you have, like sometimes we get people on our mind like Heidi Baker, we get, uh, we get uh, a CT stud, Hudson Taylor, we get all these different missionaries in our minds, and we build them up to be more than they ever were. Mm -hmm. And we make legends out of missionaries, and we start to worship the people who do missions instead of the person who sent them on missions. Yeah. And I just want to say that both Alex and I, we, um, neither one of us are superstars. We're just normal people who God called to the normal Christian life. Uh, we're not legends. And as soon as you become a legend, people stop believing they can do what you're doing. So we're not that. Um, I've been serving full time. Uh, so 2006, I got the call. I was do, uh, And then as soon as I got the call, I started coming to Southeastern. Every summer I went back between 2007 and 2010, I went back every summer, worked with an unreached people group. Then 2011 to, to the present, I've been working full-time as a missionary in Tanzania through a church in Singapore and as, a, and as a, a coordinator for the efforts of Voice of the Martyrs there in Tanzania and Comoros. And it was during that time that we met. Um, on the field, maybe you'd like to share a little bit about that, and then I'll... I'll give my side of the story. <laughs> so there's two sides to every coin. Uh, um, I feel like every time I share this story, I go at it from a different angle because it's, I feel like it's so multifaceted how our relationship became a thing. Um, well, let me see. I want to try and decide how far back to go. So oh, I'm going to go this far back. When we were at Southeastern, I didn't, we didn't know each other, but I knew of him because he would speak in chapels and um, share in classes and things like that. And so um, I remember hearing him speak in a chapel service, a renewed chapel service, and um, he was very, like, brusque and to the point, and um, he said a lot of things that I felt were not appropriate for a chapel setting. And so... <laughs> I was like, nope, this kid's weird. And I, <laughs> I was like, no, nah, I'm not interested. Like, not interested in listening to, like, what he had to say. And so, um, so I just kind of, like, just in the back of my head, just kind of marked him off as, like, the weird preacher. And was kind of, I actually avoided chapels that he was speaking at. If I knew he was going to speak, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to sleep in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but it, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't like my whole life was like marked with this active distaste for him. I was just like, nah, I'm just not going to show up to the chapels and stuff. And, um, 
And then I, uh, I started coming to Heart of the Father on my first Sunday, actually, uh, that I was here. It was on, when we were on Pipkin, and Barry stood up and started talking about this young missionary they support named Tori Rasmussen. I was like, are you serious? He said, this church, too? What the heck? <laughs> and when I first signed up for the documentary trip to Tanzania, um, I didn't know he was hosting it, and Michael Mutz was explaining the trip once we were all accepted on it. And he was like, so our host kid, Tori... And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is everywhere. I can't get away from him. <laughs> but I didn't know when I signed up, but then I was committed. So I was like, well, <laughs> I guess I'm going. Um, God has a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then once, once I started, um, saw him in Tanzania and the passion that he has, I was immediately struck with his um, determination and obedience to the Lord. And his whole reason for doing missions is not necessarily a compassionate reason. Like it's not, he's not driven by compassion for people. He's driven by obedience to the Lord. And he is driven by this desire to see Christ receive his full inheritance. And I think as a foundation, that has to be the primary reason you do any ministry because otherwise you get, you'll get burnt out. And so um, that was like the most uh, like amazing, striking thing about him that I remember. And it was one of the biggest reasons why I knew like I, I would like to work for this man because I know that his passion and his obedience is right aligned um, to Christ. Uh, but I didn't uh, think otherwise about him. And, uh, we were on the field working together and that my mind sort of, shifted in how I saw him <laughs> and looked at him a little differently and um yeah that's how anyway <laughs> I, I don't know I've never I've never talked about this in a church setting so it feels a little like <laughs> feels a little weird but <laughs> okay just you go now <laughs> she started thinking I was sexy if that's what you're trying to say <laughs> uh, that's why she didn't like me as a chapel speaker um no. <laughs> uh, okay, and so I, when she first came out to Tanzania, like, I always, okay, I always had in the back of my mind that I was going to marry someone like my age, and she's like five years younger, and then she comes out on a team, you know, that, um, that, that was out from Southeastern, so she's just a student from Southeastern. That was a cute student, but I'm not going to go for that because, you know, that's wrong, the missionary dating the student from Southeastern. That's jacked up. And then, like, yeah, that's like, that really breaks every rule in the book of missions. That's like a big no-no. Anyway, so, there's no, anyways. So, <laughs> later on, um, I was, and I also had an interest in another person. That person then came out to Tanzania. We worked alongside of each other. And when that ended, that really hurt me. Like, I don't think I've, I've been as depressed as a missionary as when that relationship ended. And it was somewhere around that time that Alex was like, I don't know if she saw an opportunity, but, <laughs> but, but I wasn't ready. Like, and I, I remember there was a time on the field where, and okay, you know like when, so there was a lot of unnecessary friction in our work lives because, I don't know, like, she liked me. I was, like, still, like, prideful and, like, no, man, I just got off. Of, I, like, I'm still hurt. Oh, feel bad for me. I, I'm, I love my work more than I want any relationship. Like, <laughs> that type of attitude. And, and, my, and my being hurt, okay, and my being closed off, to maybe something that God wanted to do, and maybe it wasn't God's timing, but in the end, I actually really hurt Alex. And she ended up leaving the field because of my obstinance. And so she came back, and I'm sure some of you all were like, why is she back? And then all of a sudden, why is she going back to Africa? Well, because this didn't work out, and this now working out. And, well, there's more reasons than that, but... <laughs> But, when I, but, but, but here's one of the things, like, oftentimes, and, I, and when she approached me, okay, it was like, hey, I've got, I've got these feelings, I knew that I should have responded. But because I was still like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready, oh, no, you know, I, I, I didn't. 
And when you know you should respond to something that God's doing, whenever you're disobedient to something, your disobedience will always hurt other people. Disobe- like being disobedient to Christ is never an island unto yourself. When Jonah went the, run, ran the other direction when he called him to Nineveh, every single person on that ship lost all their possessions. They threw everything into the sea because of someone's disobedience. And so, yeah, anyways. So, uh, then, uh, um, I don't know. I, I came back to the States and I kind of knew I did Alex wrong. And I was back in the States like, I need to meet up with this girl and make things right. Not like make things right, like let's get together. Just like, I want to be free from any hard feelings that we have towards one another. And so we went out as a group together. I was like, and then my, my, my sister-in-law, she's like, she's like, Tori, I just don't understand. You're an idiot. You are an idiot. This girl was awesome. She was on the field with you. You're just an idiot. You're always an idiot, Tori. <laughs> and I was just like, I was like, thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> and then we, I think we went to your house. Our whole family went over to your house. And then I was like, no, I really need to get one-on-one with Alex so I can, like, really make things right. And still not again in relationship. But when we were one-on-one at Gosh Sushi House, like, just up the road, things got raw. <laughs> and, and, um, and the spicy mayo started to kick in. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> this sounds fishy. <laughs> and so... Thanks, Mick. Um, anyways, so I, I started being like, this girl is actually, there's something about her. Like, we just talked. We were there for like three hours. We just talked and talked and talked. I was like, yeah, what, what is wrong with me? And then I was like, I got to think about it. I got to pray about it. But something triggered inside of me that night, and I was like, and so I went back to the mission field about two months later. I'm just like, I need to write this girl. I'm like, I need to write her. And so I wrote her on Facebook. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, my hands were, like, I was just like, I, I got to write her. I wrote her, and I was like, that's the most nervous I've been. So this is March of last, last year. I was like, I knew who she was. I knew what I had done, and I knew I'd ma- I needed to make things, we had made things right, but I knew that sometimes when you, when you mess up, God calls you right back to that place where you messed up to start all over again. And many times we want to just, we want to just continue on in life and not go back to that place where God's calling us to fix things, but I had to go, yeah, two years back, <laughs> or a year and a half before that. And been like, Alex, here it is. So, uh, and then, so yeah, we've been, we've been, uh, we started talking from March till December, a bunch on the phone, a bunch on Facebook, and I just, I really fell in love with who, who her personality, and who she was as a person. And then I got off the plane here in the states. I was like, man. This girl is actually pretty good looking. <laughs> like really good looking. And then I then we just I it's been it's been kind of a challenge for me because I want like things have moved along and at a good pace and I haven't ever wanted to outpace the situation. But at this point in my life, like I, I just when I first wrote Alex, it wasn't like it wasn't like I had these bubbly feelings. It was just I knew that I knew that I knew. Like my call to missions, this is what I need to do. And the feelings and everything else have followed behind that, knowing. And every time God's done something in my life, it's been a knowing, a deep, deep knowing. And the feelings have followed behind that. And and I, I, I look at so many other Christians' lives, and I really wish... We had more of a knowing of what God wanted us to do and less of a feeling from week to week and then losing that feeling next week and not being obedient to that feeling we had the week before. Um, so, yeah. 
If you want to add something to that, I don't know. Yeah, so um, we're now we're getting married. In two weeks. <laughs> two weeks. So um, we're getting married in two weeks, and then in about um, a couple weeks after that, we are, or a few weeks, just about three weeks after that, we'll be back in Tanzania, um, and we'll, we're going to start our ministry life together. Um, we have, um, we're both, we're both called to the mission field, obviously, but um, I think our specific niches on the mission field are slightly different. Um, so this last year, I have been, I, I actually have always kind of tried to figure out what specifically is my, um, I guess, um, career in that way on the mission field. Like, what is it specifically that I'm s supposed to do on the field or in missions, and um, this last year it became super clear to me. Um, I went to this week-long conference at the Wycliffe um, campus in Orlando called Told It Up, and it's like an introduction into um, translation and um, linguistics, and specifically uh, relating to Bible translation. And um, through that week, just realized um, a few things God definitely revealed a lot about his word to me. Um, I realized how much I take my access to the Bible for granted, um, considering there are people, there are still people groups out there who uh, have never heard the name of Jesus, who don't have, or even if they have, they don't have the Bible in their own language. Um, and yet we have so many translations in English that we can access on our phones. And um, also through that, just the weightiness of what the Bible is and how important the word is because it is Christ. And um, realizing how I have never fully appreciated that. Um, and I, I love languages so much. I love the, the little parts of languages, the grammar, the structure. I love learning languages. Um, I love comparing languages. I like translating. So through that week, and it's not something I kind of just figured out. I have always loved languages. I just never realized how well that would fit into work on the mission field. So, um, so that seemed to lead very, very easily into um, Bible translation with Wycliffe. And so, um, once we start on the field in April, um, for a little while, I'm just going to support Tori and his work as best I can um, in all the administrative ways that he needs support. He's got teams coming out constantly this year. So there's lots of, there's lots of opportunities to just support Tori and his work. And then as the Lord moves us forward, um, I'm looking to start a master's in linguistics and pursue full-time work in Bible translating with Wycliffe. Um, so that's, that's hopefully what I'm, I'm going to do. And I think it really, I actually think it goes hand in hand with what Tori does on the field. I think Bible translation and church planting are super, super compatible. They go, they go together. Um, so I think it's kind of a match made in heaven as far as like what we both feel called to do. So, um, so that's kind of specifically what I'm looking at pursuing on the field, and then Tori's got stuff too. Okay, so m most, most of what I've been doing on the mission field has been church planting work, or CPM, church planting movements. We, there's two areas specifically that we have worked the most, and that is in the Tongwe, south of Kigoma, and then in Katavi region, with the Rungwa and Pimbwe peoples. In one area, the Tongwe, we've planted more than 20 churches. And with the Rungwa, we've planted, again, more than 20 churches. Not specifically with that people group, but in that area. And the goal is through discipleship and through teaching and through, um, through evangelism, starting small groups, 
and through discipleship making movements, starting a church planting movement where they continue, where you train someone, you teach someone, and then the next go around. So let, let's say there's a, a, a beginner's class, right? Or a beginner's Bible study that you're doing for six weeks. After six weeks, the people that went through the beginner's Bible study, they'll be teaching the next round of people through the beginner's Bible study. After six weeks. Because we believe that if you know anything about Christ, you need to share that which you do know about Christ with someone who doesn't know that about Christ. And until you share what has been shared with you, you won't be able to grow in the next area of your Christian walk. And so through that, we, we've been seeing growth and movement and people coming to Jesus. Just with the Tongue I mean, when we first started working with them, there was about 30 believers spread out over a huge area. And now we have probably more, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 believers, depending on who you ask, uh, um, from that tribal group. Um, in the Rungwa, it's the same thing. There's like... There were two, actually only two believers when we began, and now there's somewhere around like 300 believers among that tribe. Among a tribe that, their people, a language, a tribe, a people that are completely distinct from any other people in Tanzania, who never had an indigenous church among their people. Worshipping together, writing songs together in their language, going on evangel in evangelism together, teaching one another the Bible. And that has been our main function. And in recent times, I'd say since 2015, my life as a missionary has taken on a much more administrative role. And before, it was a lot of frontline work. I, used to, I joke around with people. I say, I used, I used to do a lot of uh, getting stuck in rivers. Now I get stuck on Microsoft Excel. Like, <laughs> like you, when you move to administrative stuff, it's not that... It's not that what you're doing, it, it might be less flashy or less exciting, but my role in missionary work has gone from doing the frontline work to getting behind the missionaries who are on the front line and helping them get the traction they need, the support they need, the prayer coverings they need in order to do what God has called them to do. My goal in missionary work is to become less and less visible so that Christ become, might become more and more visible through more people. That is my end goal. And so we, we like my father, and a, a, I work with my father and a, a whole core, a cohort of other missionaries, uh, Tanzanian, American people from Barbados, Latvia, and other places. And through the mission school, through the Bible school, people are trained, and then they're sent out as missionaries. Once they're sent out as missionaries, that's where I come in, and my team specifically, Ben Gilzon, a guy named JR from Texas, and about oh, another four or five other Tanzanians. We get behind these Tanzanians who have gone to the field to these unreached people groups. And we see, how can we help you be the best missionary that you can be? And being, being people that are mentors, we're discipling other missionaries and helping other missionaries do what God's called them to do. And that's our vision, that's our call. Now, there's an island in Tanzania called Mafia. Okay, there's no Italians, no Russians. It's just <laughs> called Mafia, okay? And the island of Mafia is about 50,000 people. And we met, there's a church called the Free Pentecostal Church of Tanzania, which was started by started by Swedish missionaries back in the day. And then there is the Tanzanian Assemblies of God who were started through the Assemblies of God here in the U.S. Both of them have a vision for mafia. One wants to do sports programs and, and tutoring and working in the secondary school so we can begin having an inroad to the Muslim kids. And then the other group, the Assemblies of God wants to start a hospital, and that's actually something we've already done on the other side of Tanzania. Mafia is an island of 50,000 people, and only about, not, e not even a tenth of a percent of the people are, not even a tenth of the percent of the people are believers. And the believers that are on Mafia are people that move from other places in Tanzania and move there. So the Tanzanians who live on Mafia 
the local people don't even see them as local people. They see them as foreigners living in their land. And until the church is no longer seen as a foreign identity and that they as a culture, as the people on Mafia, embrace the church, that's when we'll see the real growth. So um, in each one of the churches, they have one local believer from the island. There's one Assembly of God missionary who was there for 30 years and saw one local person come to Christ in 30 years. Baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, but only saw that happen. So that's what we're going to go go work with but we believe that we we truly believe that the same discipleship making movement the practical discipling of people can be done in a muslim context in the same way that it can be done in a tribal context i do not see the power of god being afraid or the person the holy spirit being afraid of muslim people we were at a voice of the martyr conference yesterday and one of, the, one of the speakers from, I think it was the guy from Iran, he said, it's like, it's like God's got a special out right now for Muslim people. And I thought that was good. I was like, yeah, there is like a special happening right now for Muslims. And God's doing something in the Muslim community around the world, in Iran, in Somalia, in Tanzania, that is unparalleled. Another really neat thing that's happening in Tanzania is sometimes God confronts us on many levels. And one of the levels that Tanzanians have is the idea of the prosperity gospel. That if I serve Jesus, I'll be blessed with everything I could imagine. What's really neat is God's allowing famine to hit all the Christian areas of the country. And so the most Christian areas are having the worst famine and drought ever. And it's causing entire uh, portions of the community, like like half the community from a Christian area is leaving and moving to Muslim areas. So they don't even realize what God is doing in uprooting them from their Christian areas and moving them to um, these Muslim areas. And what we're really trying to do, our whole entire cohort is the Christians that have moved to these historically predominantly Muslim areas, getting them to stop seeing the Muslims as enemies and to start seeing them as an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. So not only are we looking to reach Muslims, we're looking to get Christians to see the opportunity to reach Muslims. And that what they think is an affliction against them, okay, is just an affliction against their flesh. So that the Spirit of God might use them in an area where they feel weak and they feel vulnerable. And to stop trying to have a, have, a, have a showdown with the Muslims where it's like we're better than you, but to be servants to the Muslim communities you're living among. So that, that's what, so we're moving to Mafia. We're going to spend about half the year in Mafia and about half the year in Tanzania in the places where we have been working in the past. Because sometimes missionaries leave too early, and sometimes missionaries stay too long. So we're trying to find a balance and to stay with the people that we've been working with for a long time and to kind of phase out of that and move to the east of the country. We have 32 unreached people groups in Tanzania. Four million people that belong to a tribe that has no indigenous church among them. And 26 of those unreached people groups live along the coast of Tanzania. And they're all Muslim. All of them. All 26 of them. And very devout, staunch Muslims. But sometimes it's like a pendulum swing. The further you swing out this way, the harder God pulls back the other way. And so, yeah. Um, that's what we're going to go do. We're, we've got a lot of teams coming out this summer. We have a lot happening in a very short amount of time. So ways that, um, before I share about how um, you can pray for us, I would really just like to thank this church. Beside my home church in New York, Heart of the Father was the, was, was the second church ever to begin supporting me as a missionary. And has been faithfully supporting me as a missionary 
since 2011. I was the first missionary you guys brought on, and I honestly feel so honored to be part of this church. And not only do I feel honored to be supported by every one of y'all, and I'm so thankful for that, but I love being connected to a church like this because I see different people in this church. Like, man, I see people who are in the worship team. I spoke at youth group one of the first nights that you were in the youth group. I, um, I see, like, Nick leading worship. And I remember, this is even before here, back at Abundant Life Church of God on Socrum Loop and speaking a message maybe 2008, 2009, I don't know, and Mick being so desperate and hungry for God and just wanting, desiring companionship with other men who love Jesus and then seeing him plugged into this community and leading worship. It's an honor to be a part of a church community that loves Jesus so much and that is so faithful. Um, so... Ways that you can begin, that, that you can continue praying for us, begin praying for us. Um, one, we need coworkers. We need Tanzanian coworkers, American coworkers. We need people who are serious about Jesus, or we seriously don't want them. Like we want God to bring us the right people alongside of us, who um, and who we can get behind and help. And we want to pour our lives into people. And so we just ask that you pray that the right people come right alongside of us, that we can mutually build one another up in order that we might do ministry together. Because I really, truly believe that out of genuine relationship, real ministry flows. And we need to stop having all these connections where it's just trying to get what we can out of people so it can further our vision. So let's be praying that we have the right people that come alongside of us and that we can get behind. Mm -hmm. um, pray for us. I mean, whew, we're after, three weeks after we get married, we're on the field. So pray that um, I'm not a balanced sort of a person. I just love going after things. And so I really need prayer to find the balance between ministry and marriage and the ministry of marriage, and marrying those two together. Um, and so just, just be praying for that. I, I need that. I need that. Um, because I don't want to be like in First Peter where, where it says, treat your wives right lest your prayers be hindered. Um, there's, only, there's really only one thing. I mean, there's only one, like... They, they, why, that, why, prayers of the wives don't seem to be hindered, but if the husband doesn't treat his wife right, his prayers are hindered. Like, God will not listen to him. I just see, like, like I'm praying for, like, a demon-possessed Muslim, and he's, like, coming at me. I'm like, in the name of Jesus! And I get stabbed because I didn't treat Alex right. <laughs> uh, uh, his tuck beer will come in real easy. <laughs> so just be praying. We, we need a, a special grace from God. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I've grown to love this woman so much. Yes. But, but with that said, sometimes I can get so focused on getting things done that, um, yeah, my love can grow cold. So I need the prayers of Jesus for that. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, the other side of that is I need grace for him, so, um. <laughs> so be praying for me. Yeah, <laughs> but I also need grace. I can, I can be a, um, I, I can sometimes get a little too, um, self-centered and like, oh man, he hasn't talked to me in like 20 minutes. So I... <laughs> So I need, I need, you know, grace, and that's obviously an exaggeration, but those kinds of situations where I just give him grace for the situation and um, all of that, obviously. And I think those are just also at the same time just like,
prayers for any married couple, so we appreciate those. Um, I feel like we have had extra portions of grace for this season because we have had two months to plan a wedding, and then we're going straight back to Africa, but I feel like God has blessed us so much. Um, so I just continue asking him for outrageous portions of grace because I think that um, sometimes you have not because you ask not. And so um, I've been praying for things that most people would say are, are unrealistic um, expectations, especially for, you know, like a first year of marriage. But I feel like it's possible and I feel like I'm going to ask God for it. And um, so, yeah, so um, just praying for us is also we transition into uh, the work on the field together um, and figuring out the best ways for us to work together and for God to use us um, to our highest capacity. Um, for me personally, um, transitioning back into Africa, I've been here in the States for a little over two years, and um, I'm a little bit nervous about going back. Um, God has taught me a lot about what it means to be obedient, and um, I, I really hope and pray that um, I can continue in obedience to him on the field, and so just be praying for me as I try and transition back to a life in, on the field. Um, and also, I was reminded earlier um, when Dave was talking about um, abundant life for that, that, we, that Christ came to bring us, and I was thinking about the reality of what that means for us, and um, it does have a holistic application, um, but I truly think that sometimes we forget that life is not, is not, um, is not just our natural world. Then when he talks about life, he's talking about more than just that. And um, I correlated it to the prayer that the early church prayed in Acts 4 after persecution. They did not pray that there would be no more persecution, and they did not pray for relief. They prayed for courage to continue doing God's work in the midst of persecution. It was like they weren't even... It's like they weren't centered on the persecution. They were centered on what they had to do. And I feel like that's important for us to remember. Um, as we go out into the mission field, I think sometimes people want to pray for safety for us. And um, that's good. My parents will be praying for that. So you can just join with them on that probably. But, but at the same time, I really, really, really ask for you to center prayers for us more on courage and perseverance more than anything else. And um, a boldness, it, they, their specific prayer was to continue boldly proclaiming. So, um, so praying for us to continue in boldness what we're doing. So um, rather than just praying like that we would be safe or that he would um, keep us from harm or, or anything like that, praying for boldness for us to continue doing the work. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's good. I want to share something real quick with you guys from the Word. It's in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. It says, My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. So often we read this passage by itself. And I'd like to bring it into the broader context of the scriptures this morning. We, we come to Jesus and we're like, well, um, okay. We, and, and oftentimes we, we just read verse 28 through 30 and we don't read verse 27 in conjunction with that. We just read, come to me all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. And we come to Jesus and we offer our lives up to him. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. I meet so many unbelievers who don't have that rest 
But I also meet many believers who don't have rest and seem to be burdened, seem to be carrying a lot on their shoulders. In Jeremiah chapter 27, verse 1, this is the message that came to Jeremiah from the, from the Lord early in the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord said to me, make a yoke and fasten it to your neck with leather straps. Then send messages, messages to the kings through their ambassadors who have come to see King Zedekiah in Jerusalem. Give them this message for their masters. This is what the Lord of heaven, our, heaven's army says, the God of Israel. With my great strength and powerful arm, I made the earth and its people and every animal. I give these things of mine to anyone I choose. Back to Matthew. Sorry. My father has entrusted everything to me because God chose to give everything to Christ. My favorite passage, which I've shared almost every single time I've come and shared here, is Daniel 7, 13 through 14. And we see that God giving Jesus everything, especially over the nations of this earth. So God gives anything he wants to anyone he chooses. But in verse 6 of chapter 27, Now I give, you country, give your countries to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who is my servant. I have put everything, even the wild animals, under his control. When his grandson begins to think too highly of, oh, sorry, not his grandson. When, when he begins to think too highly of himself, um, he goes crazy and becomes like a wild animal because he believes that all these things were by his own power and his own ability. He begins to go crazy and God puts him beneath the wild animals and makes him like a wild animal so he recognizes who put him in control of all the wild animals, God himself. All the nations will serve him, his son and his grandson, until his time is up. Then many nations and great kings will conquer and rule over Babylon. So you must submit to Babylon's king, serve him, put your neck under Babylon's yoke. I will punish any nation that refuses to be a slave, says the Lord. I will send war, famine, and disease upon that nation until Babylon has conquered it. Do not listen to false prophets, fortune tellers, interpreters of dreams, medians, or sorcerers who say, the king of Babylon will not conquer you. If you want to live, submit to the yoke of the king of Babylon and to his people. Why do you insist on dying, you and your people? Why should you choose war, famine, and disease, which the Lord will bring against every nation that refuses to submit to Babylon's king? Do not listen to the false prophets who keep telling you, the king of Babylon will not conquer you. There are so many parallels between King Nebuchadnezzar and Jesus. The difference is King Nebuchadnezzar was given a time period. Him, his son, and his grandson, and then the time is up. In Daniel 7, 13 through 14, it says, His kingdom and his rule is an eternal kingdom that will never end and will never be destroyed. Both of them are given sovereignty, honor, and dominion over all the earth. The difference is one sovereignty and dominion over all the peoples of the earth is eternal and one is temporary. One will conquer the nations and the other, the nations will conquer him. One's yoke is a heavy yoke to bear. And one of the reasons Babylon is judged so severely is because in their conquering, they were unjust to the people they conquered. And so God then has to punish them for the excise of abuse of power. Christ never has abused his power even one time. From the beginning to now, Christ is sovereign. And in his sovereignty and in his complete authority over all the nations of the earth, he is unlimited grace for all of us until the day that we pass away. And that unlimited grace ceases. 
Because the time of our judgment has come. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Again, the, the Bible writers are referring to how the Romans conquered the world. And those who, in their conquering, in the Romans conquering, were like, yeah, we'll give in. We will come under the authority and the rule of the Roman Empire. Began paying taxes, began serving the emperor, and began calling emperor son of God. Jesus is son of God to each and every single one of us. And is asking, when they use that term son of God, Jesus is challenging the rule of Rome. And the writers of the New Testament are saying, we have an emperor whose kingdom will never end. And you, like Nebuchadnezzar, your rule too will end. When all the conquered nations were brought before Caesar, if they surrendered in peace... They knelt before him, confessed he was Lord, and were allowed to continue living. For those who fought against Caesar, they were dragged in chains, forced to kneel and confess that Jesus, and the, sorry, that, that, that Caesar is Lord, and then they were put to death. Jeremiah says, Submit to the yoke of the king of Babylon and his people. Why do you insist on dying, you and your people? Why choose war, famine, and disease? He said, Lord will bring against every nation that refuses to submit to Babylon's king. You mentioned that Jesus, all he wants to do is bring life. And when God has given everything under Jesus' authority and control, in the Great Commission, Jesus says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them, these new disciples, to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. The yoke he gives us is so light. But we as the church refuse to make disciples. We as the church refuse to teach other people how to be obedient to Christ because we ourselves are not obedient to Christ. But when we submit to Christ in obedience, when we trust and obey, we find there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. We find that yoke which is so light over our shoulders. It is amazing. Like sometimes we think of obedience as absolute sacrifice. But David Livingston said, if serving an earthly king is considered an honor, then why is serving a heavenly king considered a sacrifice? And when we live Jesus and when we serve Jesus in obedience, there is a grace given to us that makes that obedience actually somewhat light. Mm -hmm. But it's when we pretend we're being obedient and we start doing the things that we want to do and what Christ has not asked us to do that our obedience starts looking really heavy. And we start being exasperated by it because we're doing it in our strength, by our own vision, by our own plans. And we become exasperated. And then we're like, what gives? Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But I look at the nations. And I see war, famine, and disease in the nations. A war against Christ. The war is, and false, false prophets are everywhere. No, Christ. This Christ isn't going to rule over everything. You can do whatever you want to do. There's no consequence for what you want to do. We have false prophets everywhere. Live the way you want to live and somehow you'll still please God. It's the American dream. I can be a nation under Christ and live like the devil. One nation under God, but completely rejecting his sovereignty. Mm. And so, I, and, I, and, I, and we look at our, I mean, our, our, we, it, when, when I see war, famine, and disease, we're warring against Christ. Mm. Our souls are famished and our minds are poisoned and diseased. Because we simply will not submit to the one who says, come to me. 
all you who are weary and heavy laden. I would love, like, I know God's call on my life. I know God's call on my life to be a missionary. But if I rejected that call to be a missionary at this point in my life, maybe God will call me elsewhere in the future. I would be the most miserable man in the world. But I can sit in a mud hut, fellowshipping with my brothers and sisters in Christ, eating rice and beans, which I hate so much, <laughs> and actually be completely satisfied with life. Yeah. Yep. Because I've submitted to the yoke. Mm -hmm. I've submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ in the place he's called me to. Mm. And I have the same belief for our marriage. I'm submitting to the yoke. But the best part is, we're evenly yoked. Because both of us together is submitting to the yoke which Christ is putting on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. And that gives me great confidence and great courage. Dave, would you like to come back? We are going to the nations. We are going to the nations because we believe that Christ has a message of deliverance. We're not going for their sake. We're going for Christ's sake. But in going for Christ's sake, He will deliver the nations. We're not going there as white saviors. <laughs> we're, not go we're nothing. Christ is everything. And our job is to point everything back to Jesus. Yeah. I'm going to ask Barry to pray for them as a couple, and I want you to stretch your hands out towards them. Nobody moving. We're going to be taking an offering right after this, but I want Barry to pray first. Father, we thank you for these that have heard your call and your voice and have said, hear my Lord. I respond. I was made for you, and I will do what you made me for. So, Father, we know that you are going to take care of them, that you're going to lead and guide them. And all of those things that we would pray for from a human perspective as far as protection and provision and all of those things. And we do desire those for them. And we know that you have them firmly in your hand and those are not a problem for you. But, Lord, we pray now as a community over them. We pray your priorities over their life, Lord. When you taught us to pray, you said pray that... God's name would be hallowed. And so, Lord, we pray over them and over their marriage, over their life, over their ministry, that your name would be exalted, that you would make your name famous and great in Tanzania and in their home and in every community in which they move, that the name of Jesus would be the name that is exalted, that his name would be made great and that knees would bow to that name and that hearts would bow and submit to that name, that you would hallow your name and make it great in their lives. And Lord, we pray over them that your kingdom would come, that you who sit on the throne, who has an agenda for Tanzania and for each individual there and for Tori and Alex, that you would cause that agenda to come to pass in its fullness. That your kingdom would come, that your reign and your rule and your power even, Lord, would move things and change things and that you would transform even the atmosphere in Tanzania that you would rule and set up your kingdom and your reign there where the enemy has set up his throne and said, I'm ruling here. You would come and say, no, I'm the king of Tanzania and my rule will happen in this place and even in the lives of individuals. Let it be so, and Lord, we pray also that your will would be done, that every detail of the plan that you have made for them, even before they were born, the good works that you have prepared for them beforehand to walk in, that you would give them clarity and understanding of heart and sensitivity of spirit to walk in the way of your will, that they would fulfill everything that you have called them to do and to be. And so we pray, Father, that you would have your way. And in doing that, there is abundant grace. In doing that, there is abundant provision. In doing that, no one can snatch them out of your hand, for you are mightier than all. And so, Lord, we thank you that all of those things come as a secondary uh, deal to the main thing being the main thing, and that is that you are exalted, that your kingdom comes, and that your will is done in them. So that's what we pray over them. Let it be a banner over them. 
Lord, let your hand be so evident everywhere they go because their hearts are submitted to you and to your way. And we just pray in simple fashion as a community over them. Have your way. Do your will and glorify your mighty name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a round of applause while they go back to their seats.